Well, hello, everybody, and good evening, uh, good morning, or good day, depending uh, what time of day it is where you are joining uh, this event. Delighted to have you with us. Um, thank you very much for coming along to this panel discussion as part of the Cambridge Conversation series of discussions. This is actually the 16th of those discussions that we've instituted here at Cambridge uh, during the pandemic to keep the connection, I guess, between uh, our research, our alumni and the wider public out there um, during the strange times that we've all been living through. My name is Dennis Groob. I'm a professor of politics and public policy here at Cambridge where I'm also acting director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. The format for this evening uh, is that we will uh, have a chat as a panel about these interesting questions on the politics of expertise and decision-making for the first half an hour or so. And I'll introduce my uh, colleague colleagues on the panel in a moment. Uh, and then for the last 20 minutes or so, it will be over to you out there in online land, uh, and we will have a go at answering some of your questions. Now you can submit questions at any time during uh, the webinar um, through the magic of the Q&A button that should be there at the bottom of your screen. Um, and with the wonders of technology, something will then appear on my screen, uh, my second screen over here. I have two screens and a mobile phone. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, it's, it's not easy being a middle-aged academic surrounded by this much technology, but I'm confident that we will in fact manage it. Before I introduce the topic and my colleagues on the panel, can I just say uh, at the outset that um, all of us on the panel are very much aware that we are holding this discussion in the shadow of the terrible events in Ukraine. The University of Cambridge, of course, has alumni in Ukraine, including people that those of us on the panel have taught, and in Russia, where many people continue to stand uh, against the war at great personal risk. So I just want to start tonight's event by saying that everyone who is in harm's way in this conflict is in our thoughts, um, even as tonight we focus this conversation on questions of expertise and decision-making here in the UK context. So to the topic at hand, and I think uh, very few people uh, will need um, reminding of the pertinence of the issue of uh, the relationship between politics and expertise. All of us around the globe have been through some kind of monstrous natural experiment really in the last two years, uh, examining the different ways in which governments uh, can interrelate with expertise, how politics plays into that, uh, and what some of the results can be from that interaction. We're very fortunate here at Cambridge to be examining some of those questions through research, uh, both in the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, where I lead a research stream on decision-making uh, in, in politics, um, and through, um, for example, another project called Expertise Under Pressure, through the Crash Research Centre, um, which is also looking uh, very much at these questions. And, the kind of questions we're interested in are, you know, not just how policy decisions are made, but who makes them and where, how is expertise communicated to government and how effectively, and, you know, what are the appropriate roles of different members of cabinet, of advisors, of civil servants uh, and outside experts in that process. So joining me today to discuss some of these questions are Professor Anna Alexandrova, who is a professor in the philosophy of science here in Cambridge, a fellow of King's College, Cambridge, and is principal investigator on that expertise under pressure project that I mentioned at the Center for Humanities and Social Change. And Professor Sir John Aston, 
John is the Harding Professor of Statistics and Public Life here in Cambridge. And he's also a former Chief Scientific Advisor at the Home Office, where he was Director General for Science, Technology, Analysis, Research and Strategy. It sounds very easy, John, and I'm looking forward to um, discussing some of that as we uh, progress this evening. So that is by way of introduction. Let me um, perhaps frame up a first question. So, so when I think about the relationship between politics and expertise, I sort of reflect on the fact that in many ways, expertise or science, as the politicians like to refer to it, relies on inherent ambiguity. Science is about probabilities and the modeling of uncertainty and an understanding that um, it's very difficult to give an exact um, um, a bit of advice on any particular component of policy, whereas politics thrives on um, certainty, on uh, sort of binary choices. We either wear a face mask or we don't. We either get vaccinated or we don't. So there is a bit of a, an inherent tension there. But at the start of this pandemic, we, um, we turned to the experts. We were looking for expertise. Politicians were looking for expertise. And yet some members of the public, self-evidently, um, we're looking for politicians to, in a sense, stand up to expertise and push back um, against some of the recommendations. So, uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps, John, if I can ask you first, this, this tension between expertise and politics, uh, how do you see it? Well, thanks, Dennis. And uh, it's, it's really nice to join you and uh, Anna this evening. For me, I think... Expertise is one element of decision making. Uh, for me, as a chief scientific advisor, it was always important that the information that people needed to make good decisions was available to them, but that it was certainly wasn't about science or expertise making those decisions. For me, I think I should clarify from the outset that uh, chief scientific advisors in government are responsible for trying to get scientific information into the decision making process where science is a very broad category in, in, in reality. It's not just physical, biological sciences, as you might think, but it also includes things like information science, so statistics, etc. But also it includes uh, social sciences and humanities. So really trying to get that expertise, particularly academic expertise, uh, into the decision-making process so that good decisions uh, can be made. Now, of course, politicians are those in this country, are those who are elected through a democratic process to make decisions. But from my point of view, as a CSA, my role was to make sure that ministers, senior officials got access to independent scientific in its broadest sense advice. And that advice could then be used when they made their decisions. But for me, there was always quite a clear delineation. Decision makers get to make the decisions, but the experts can hopefully add to those decision making processes by giving, adding that expertise into that decision making process. And, and is, is the advice welcome, John, in your experience? Were there, were there moments when it wasn't welcome? So I think that's a good question. I think in reality, people like to know information about the decisions they're going to make. That doesn't mean, and I think it's very important that I think for government, um, particularly before the decision, there's a lot that needs to go into that decision that should be part of a quiet discussion that allows people to actually make good decisions. And I think there, getting information across in a way that often actually has to tell people that it is uncertain and that there aren't clear cut answers. And I think, uh, it was very clear, particularly in the pandemic, and particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, that there was a lot less known about the pandemic than there is now. And that had to be communicated as part of the decision-making process. And so while it's not always easy to get that across, it is important that people understand both what, in, in the sort of generic terms, the science can tell you, but also very clearly what it can't tell you. And making sure that that is well communicated is part of the role of experts, as well as actually communicating uh, the information itself. Arno, can I come to you? Is that your, your sense of the role of, of, of experts, the way John's put it? Uh, thank you. Yes, it's great to be here. I appreciate uh, all the attendees and my fellow panellists. 
uh, it was extremely exciting for uh, me and my team of expertise under pressure to study expertise um, at the time of uh, the pandemic. And the reason why it was so exciting is because um, in 2020, we felt, um, you know, as we moved into the pandemic properly in this country, uh, it felt like the return of the experts after a certain winter into which, um, uh, at least in the public imagination, they were relegated uh, following uh, the enduring and following the Brexit referendum. So at that point, we were told by our leading politicians that this country had had enough of experts and there was um, a, a general uh, phenomenon that uh, some scholars identified as the crisis of expertise. And uh, so March, 2020, when uh, the public discussion again focused uh, very much on uh, the grounds on which uh, various decisions can be made in the government and the justification for it and the, uh, the very central role of scientists in it felt like a, um, a springtime of expertise. And of course, we can talk about whether or not that springtime uh, lasted, but nevertheless, I think it was it was a moment uh, to capture and to understand. And yes, definitely the way John uh, puts, puts it forward, uh, expertise being one uh, item and one very important ingredient in the decision-making, that idea felt like it was back. The return of expertise, it's almost like a Star Wars plot, Anna, isn't it? Um, and uh, to, to draw that out a little bit more then, uh, and I know you've looked at this in your research, who, who, who is an expert? What constitutes expertise? You know, the three of us here are, are experts on expertise, and there is perhaps some irony in that. Um, but uh, can anybody just nominate themselves as an expert? Um, and, and does that then give you a right as an expert to participate in the policy process in a particular way? Shall I start on that? Let me start in a very kind of academic -y way. Um, definitions of expertise uh, is a question that you encounter in several uh, fields and several disciplines. In discipline of philosophy, especially epistemology, which is a theory of knowledge, uh, the, the, the de definition of expertise is usually just greater knowledge or greater understanding than um, a, another person. So it is understood very much as kind of uh, uh, the, the ability to have more knowledge. Whereas uh, the, if in uh, other social sciences, um, for example, sociology or political science, what people study is much more expert networks. That means the social conditions that enable people who uh, have a claim to uh, knowledge to uh, put themselves forward as having a certain power and a certain influence. And I think that divide between a definition of expertise in terms of knowledge versus a definition of expertise in terms of claim to knowledge is a fundamental cleavage that uh, you see um, still in, in many fields. Thank you, Anna. Um, I mean, that's really useful for, for framing uh, the next question in some ways, which um, I'll put to you first, John, which is, uh, should experts be making decisions um, in, in our political process? If, if they are the, the holders of knowledge, um, surely there is some uh, sound argument to be made that um, they can be contributing to the decision-making process more fully. Perhaps, John, if I start with you first. So, I mean, I think that we, I mean, so I think both Anna and I have mentioned it already that the expertise that goes into decision-making is only one part of the decision-making process. And it's only one part of the information you need to make a decision. And so for me, it was very clear that um, as an advisor, um, and a, a chief scientific advisor, but as an advisor, I was there to give advice, not to make decisions. But the most important thing for me was to make sure that advice was part of the decision, but then the, to step away and let the decision be 
decision be made. I think that for me, there is many different parts of expertise. I think there's expertise that comes from uh, within the system and before the decision is made. And then there is uh, expertise about assessing that decision afterwards. And I think that for me, it was important that those who are making decisions get access to the advice they need pre prior to the decision in a way that allows them to make that decision in a, um, in a calm and rational manner, taking into account the expertise and the other factors that they need to draw in as well. Um, and then maybe after that, there is that discussion in a wider public forum about what the expertise is, is, is saying. But for me, the expertise that gets put in, so the advice that comes from scientists and other, other people um, is part of the decision-making process, but certainly should not be responsible for making the decision. I like calm and rational manner. That, that sounds like an ideal goal, John. Um, Anna, would, uh, how, how, do you, how do you see that? Um, let me supplement uh, John's picture with um, um, basically a, a more abstract way of putting the same thing. Here's a, a general philosophical justification of why uh, expertise is necessary. When uh, philosophers uh, talk about it, they usually make an argument of division, necessity to divide epistemic labor. And that is just a, a simple idea that uh, there are too many facts to know for any particular person. And uh, uh, it is no longer possible to be that um, Kantian agent that always figures things out for herself and never relies on anyone's testimony. Um, Kant had that uh, image in his famous uh, essay, What is Enlightenment? And uh, the necessity of expertise is a rejection precisely of that picture. And a rejection, I think, for a very good reason. Because if Kant was right, then it would never be uh, reasonable to rely on uh, anyone's testimony for anything. Uh, so the, what is an expert? An expert is someone with whom we decide to divide epistemic labor. You know about one thing, I will know about another thing, a third person will occupy themselves with something else entirely. When we have to make uh, really important decisions, uh, democratic decisions uh, that have all sorts of uh, uh, require judgments of complex empirical facts, uh, the existence of an expert is the reason why we're able to make these complex decisions in a legitimate way. The, the expert is a person that we have asked as a democratic community to know certain things, to, to accumulate uh, a certain knowledge, and the expert then uh, uh, steps up when we ask them. So this is the overall theory. This is how it's supposed to work, right? And uh, note uh, two assumptions that this picture rests on. Um, the first is the assumption of uh, the expert in general, um, uh, the existence of an expert who is independent enough such that they do not depend um, for their livelihood and for their dignity on the grace of whoever asks them to make uh, the decision. So they, are, they do not need to participate in the political economy that uh, shows their uh, necessity, right? Everybody understands that they are necessary. That's the first uh, um, uh, assumption. The second really big assumption is that an expert is able to line up facts rather than values. So the distinction between a factual knowledge and an evaluative knowledge, knowledge about what is rather than what it, what should be, is uh, another crucial assumption of uh, that picture. So um, I think what we find is whenever crisis of expertise rears its uh, uh, ugly head, um, whether during the pandemic or before that, it rears its ugly head precisely because there is a perception that one of these conditions, either the independence or the uh, fact value is not met. Uh, thank you. And um, I mean, given that, 
uh, and, and given the experience we've all been through in this pandemic, is it possible for experts to uh, communicate their expertise in a political environment without then themselves becoming politicised by it? And what I mean by that is not that, um, you know, suddenly our experts are trying to pursue a partisan line, uh, but that once you put advice into the public domain, you, you lose control of it and you can't necessarily control how others might choose to perceive it. Um, uh, and, you, you know, you put that alongside some of the, the visuals that we've seen, not just here in the UK, but, but around the world of scientific experts uh, appearing alongside politicians. Um, you know, the, 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 the emergence of the, the celebrity scientist almost through the pandemic has been something to behold. Uh, I mean, perhaps, John, if I can ask, ask you that question, is, is there a, a danger of becoming politicised or, or is it just, does it just go with the territory of providing evidence-based advice to government that you then have to accept what government and indeed what citizens um, choose to, to make of that advice? So I think there's there's two stages to that. I think there is an importance, which I think is, is, is very important, that the decision making and the advice around the decision making is done in a way that preserves the decision making process. So it is not necessarily a public decision making process. I think that having the ability to have that quiet conversation uh, where, you know, of course, you need to take into account the context that you're working in, but you don't need to have that partisan nature. You can um, inform about the information rather than try to persuade some particular course of action. And for me, that was that was incredibly important. I was there to inform about the information that I had to help inform using the science rather than trying to persuade that course A or course B or course C was the correct one to do. Because of course, I don't have all the information. I only have the information that is relevant to the scientific expertise. And we've said already that there are multiple other pieces of information that need to come into that decision. So that's that's before the decision is made. I think there is also a role uh, for scientists to communicate around, this, around the scientific evidence after the decision made, is made. And I think there's roles for two sets of individuals. There are, there's roles for those who were part of the decision and who are part of that decision-making process, who helped inform that decision-making process. They need to then help explain the evidence that they presented. And I think that is what we've seen um, in, um, in many of the uh, more public briefings that scientists in government have done. But I also think that there is a real value to um, other experts who are outside the decision making process being able to comment on that evidence as well, because that's how the scientific process works. The scientific process works by people looking at the data, challenging the assumptions and saying, what does this mean? What does this mean? And you get better science. So I think that there is absolutely a role for government experts to explain, but there is also a big role, and we've seen it um, uh, in many of our news broadcasts and others, of experts who are outside the decision-making process commenting on how that decision-making process has used the evidence uh, that has been presented or what the evidence says that went into that decision-making process. But I, so I think that there is there is roles for different types of experts at that point in time. And I think if it's done well, that can balance out um, uh, the issue of partisanship. And I think particularly if you look at um, SAGE and the way it did its decision making, it did, the, you know, it had its meetings, it communicated that uh, information into the decision making process, but then also afterwards published the uh, reports that it had uh, used in, in formulating that advice. And I think that public uh, information was then you could be used by anybody to see what kind of scientific information was used in formulating that advice. Fascinating and you know then some of the the members of SAGE and some of the more publicly um, visible experts feeding into the process then also received you know um, emails and, and pressure and, and newly sort of uh, public um, profiles that played into how people communicated with them, I guess. And so, um, I mean, Anna, perhaps if I can ask you, should we should we be worried about that? You, you know, um, is, is the public domain, if you like, the right place for experts, given the nature of the 21st century public domain, which is, um, 
you know, can often feel like a bit of a free for all, um, given social media and 24 seven news and all the pressures that go along with it? Well, I very much uh, uh, admire and uh, respect the enormous uh, anguish and pressure that it, that being in the public eye has thrown on uh, some of our experts. And we have seen uh, in our own research, we um, even have developed a concept of the anguished experts when we uh, interview experts who uh, were asked to um, make even just a simple factual judgment. Uh, the, the enormous amount of um, anguish about, you know, where, whether they, are, they have the right level of knowledge, whether they have the right disciplinarity uh, in order to say it, and whether they, how should they formulate what they're saying, given that it is a, a, a public act is, uh, I mean, it's not to be underestimated. We tend to, there is an image of an expert as uh, confident and arrogant and just shooting from the hip and knowing uh, what to say and having a sound bites. But we, yes, we shouldn't forget that other hidden side of uh, experts that come with an enormous uh, uh, anguish. So having said that, I think it is uh, really, uh, a bit unsurprising to see um, where such a pressure uh, might come from and why it can uh, generate. So arguably, you know, the, the, the picture that uh, uh, many uh, experts such as uh, uh, John and uh, uh, Patrick Balance express often in their remarks is it's incredibly important for them to maintain this uh, um, uh, self-conception of uh, value, freedom, and independence. Um, it is they, they very often formulate this uh, as uh, experts should be on tap rather than on top, and that's the same idea as uh, uh, John said, as that just being one input. Um, so here is where the problem arises. Suppose that the sort of judgments that the experts are asked to make, they're still only factual, they're not about what should be done, but they are judgments about um, what I in my own research call value-laden facts, right? Facts about uh, uh, well-being, facts about uh, health, fact facts about uh, appropriateness, resilience, um, um, and quality of life, uh, development, progress, and so what. In all of those cases, uh, experts are asked uh, not just to, uh, you know, yeah, make predictions about where a certain indicator will move up or down and uh, to what extent, but they're also asked to make a judgment about what counts as uh, well-being or what counts as healthy functioning, what counts as quality of life. And when they make claims like that, uh, there is no avoiding values. There is no avoiding uh, making a judgment about um, that, that a lot of people think uh, should be private judgments. Or at the very least, you know, we all have expertise on, uh, uh, you know, what our health consists on, what our quality of life consists in. And uh, I think plenty of uh, uh, distrust of uh, expert judgments in the case of um, uh, the COVID advice have been precisely uh, the stability of the experts to walk the line between facts and values. Some of the early models that uh, promised uh, that if you don't do, if you if you don't do anything, there will be um, uh, you know, a quarter of a million deaths uh, from COVID uh, were models that, you know, on the face of it were presented as just factual claims, but uh, they made or at least were presented and with a great deal of value judgments, such as these are the only costs that are relevant to consider 
and the costs of uh, lockdown to say mental health of uh, the children who can't go to school are not a relevant cost in the, to consider in this model. And it's true that you know uh, an expert can be very careful about how they um, frame uh, what they're saying, and perhaps they could have been more careful, uh, or perhaps they were already plenty careful, careful enough. But bottom line is, in the public sphere, uh, the perception is the experts making judgments about what's good for us on the basis of what they include and what they don't include in a model. Uh, this is where most of the frustration and controversy comes from, and it is uh, not exactly unmotivated. And I thank you. Value-laden facts. Uh, what a great phrase. Um, uh, John, do you just want to come in on that for 30 seconds, and then I'll, uh, it'll be time to go to some audience questions out there. But um, I'd be interested in your view on value-laden facts. Sure. So, I mean, for me, I think Anna uh, sort of really hits it on the head that you have to be really careful about looking at one set of expertise. I think that what really counts is being able to bring multiple different viewpoints from multiple different academic areas into, uh, into the discussion so that you can have a much more wide ranging uh, understanding of what is actually happening. So I think for me, making sure that there were was expertise around uh, both uh, the uh, epidemiology but also around the economics, also around the social uh, implications. Uh, all of these things um, were very much needed to be part of that decision-making process. And then as representatives of the people, sometimes politicians will have to make decisions. And those decisions should be very clear as to what the evidence they are based on. And hopefully, if people like me have done their job properly, then that decision-making process will have taken into account a very wide range of information that should help balance out those decisions. But I absolutely agree that it should be very, very clear what um, uh, information is going into those decisions and what assumptions are being used to make, uh, uh, to make, to, to make that information available, because those assumptions can be, uh, can be key uh, in understanding the information that's in front of you. What a great discussion. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to move now. Uh, I can see questions streaming in here, actually. Um, so let me see if I can dissect a few for us. Uh, well, this is an interesting one here. Um, and perhaps, uh, perhaps if I start this one uh, with you, John, uh, how much of a problem is lack of scientific background among politicians in discriminating between good and bad evidence um, when it's presented to them. Um, if they don't have that background knowledge, does it leave them vulnerable? Or is it in fact um, the job of the expert to um, make sure that they're not vulnerable as a result? So I think it's a really good question. I think that would, would I personally like uh, everybody to have a higher level of scientific understanding? Yes, probably. You know, I think everybody should take a statistics course. That would certainly uh, be, a, um, a, be a good thing. Uh, but I might be slightly biased given my background. Um, so I think that the real role of someone who is in my position, which was an advisor, is to help with the translation. It's really, really important that we realise that a politician is never going to have the level of expertise in any scientific discipline than the experts have. So absolutely, we should be trying to upskill um, uh, all those people who make decisions to, to have the best, ex to have the best uh, ability to understand as possible. But we also have to realise that there is, a, you know, there is an, a role for experts in actually being able to, to have that information um, available to politicians. But that has to be translated. So my role very much was not about doing the science. My role was about translating the science. So there are experts um, uh, you know, in many universities across the country and across the world who contributed huge amounts of evidence into uh, the decision-making process. But it was my role to try to make sure that that, ex that expertise was condensed into a form that could actually be actively understood. And so I think that there's actually a role for translation both ways. I think that it's not just about um, politicians becoming better at doing science. It's also about scientists becoming better at understanding how their information 
is used in a policy making context. And I think the closer we can come together and then have people in roles like the one I did helps actually bridge that gap because sometimes policy um, is going to need to ask questions of science. And sometimes scientists want to want to give information into the policy making process. And it is always a two way uh, interaction. It's never just a one way information flow. John. Everybody should do a statistics course. I think that is a value laden piece of advice, my friend. Um, so uh, let me shift to another question here, Anna, for you, actually, um, if I can, which is, is it appropriate for an expert to publicly disagree with an elected politician's interpretation of science? Um, you know, uh, if, if you see science essentially being misinterpreted uh, as an expert, um, should you be uh, out there in the public domain correcting that um, as part of uh, the process of being a public expert? Well, not just appropriate, but uh, it is a duty. <laughs> um, the, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's a great question because it allows us to come back to that ideal that I've tried to articulate uh, at first. Right. The only way we could justify uh, a role, a, a legitimate role for an expert in a democratic society is if uh, the very, uh, in the very nature of that role is an independence. Um, sometimes, as we have seen, such an independence is very hard and perhaps even impossible. But uh, this is a case that seems very easy and simple. This is a case in which uh, the expert isn't playing their uh, goal in democratic society unless they actually do take that difficult step and stick their neck out and criticize. And uh, if that means that they lose their, um, their standing and it, or their, 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 their role, uh, then we know uh, that we're not handling expertise right. A great answer, Anna, and, and a very challenging one, I guess, um, for experts out there. Uh, there's an interesting um, question here about essentially the delegation of, of policy making. So um, uh, the, the questioner is suggesting it's been delegated successfully to independent committees of experts before for something like the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee is an example. Uh, why can't we extend this model into other policy making areas? I, I guess my answer from a political science point of view is, of course, well, um, uh, there is potential there for a democratic deficit in decision making. And uh, there is built into our understanding of representative democracy uh, an expectation that the people we elect will make uh, those decisions. Um, and uh, you know, th there is a tension there because the, the, uh, the case is, is a very well-made one that um, uh, the independence of the Bank of England has been really key in uh, helping to um, control uh, things for over uh, over two decades now. Perhaps, John, do you have a view, or, or Anna, um, do you have a view on uh, on the sort of delegation uh, aspect? I think that I would agree with you that when, when decisions and the tools to make those decisions are relatively well-defined, it is easier to um, uh, allow people a certain flexibility within a framework. So the Bank of England responds to a request for government around how they are going. It's, it's the tool that is used rather than the specific objective that is set by um, the Bank of England. Um, and I think that as you get further and further away from a single tool or a single set of tools, um, uh, it becomes harder and harder, in particular when, as Anna's pointed out, you start to have to play off very different value judgments. And um, I think that if you are having to balance up um, a, one part of the population with another part of the population. Uh, that is something which is, uh, you know, by sort of construction, something that is uh, done through a democratic process. So for me, that would be much, much harder to do from a set of experts than through a, a democratic, uh, politically dri uh, driven decision making process. I too am grateful for this question because it allows us to articulate nicely the uh, ideal of a technocracy 
uh, the ideal of a government by uh, the the experts and uh, the very you know, all the many reasons um, that John and I brought up uh, about. Uh, why this is not right apply in this case as well. And I should mention that uh, a Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee is not an uncontroversial uh, example here. And that uh, uh, I think Bank of England is now trying to do a lot more of public engagement um, uh, around uh, you know, their policies and people being able to have an input in it. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that's a, a response to uh, people you know, not finding the technocratic ideal a, a very good ideal. Thank you, Anna. It's a, it's a very, very good point um, and, and speaks to some of the underlying pressures in our democracy. Uh, look, there is an interesting question here about um, expertise and the, the, the fact that, we, you know, we talk about uh, empirical facts and a sort of a rational view of the world. I think um, John used the term rational. Um, and the questioner is asking, but don't scientists or, or experts also have, you know, intuitive um, feelings? Uh, and, and how does that play into the kind of advice and the way that they are then using facts and uh, and knowledge. Um, interesting question. Uh, Pat, Anna, I'm looking at you, so um, let me <laughs> pitch to you. Yes, I have uh, I have lots to say in this excellent question. Um, I think uh, philosophy of knowledge, that is epistemology, has moved on uh, from the idea that knowledge only comes in uh, uh, propositional claims about what is the case that are justifiable uh, by uh, appeal to a certain fixed set of uh, empirical observations and, and nothing else. And uh, over the course of uh, uh, 20th century, both Cambridge historians and philosophers of science and others have do documented all the many ways in which uh, unformalizable, implicit knowledge, uh, uh, judgment calls as that sometimes is very even hard to articulate in words uh, how absolutely crucial they are for, you know, at every stage in formulating theories and evaluating theories and even in uh, uh, testing them. And uh, whether or not that's good, I mean, I think it's good. I think we need to adjust our vision of what knowledge is to include all sorts of, you know, being able to ride a bicycle is a kind of knowledge, even when you can't put it into words. And that example can be, you know, can generalize uh, um, in theoretical science as well. John, um, do you want to do you want to weigh in on that on this 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 uh, sense of whether or not um, uh, the rational expert uh, also is allowed to refer to other types of knowledge and intuition and, and um, etc. So I mean I think that it's almost impossible not to be part. I mean so take the pandemic. We were all, everybody who was, take, who was taking part in giving uh, scientific advice during the pandemic was living through the pandemic. It wasn't some abstract thing that was happening to other people somewhere else. It was happening to them, their family, their friends. So, of course, that is something that is going to, you know, be part of, uh, you know, the person that they are. However, I think for many experts, they work exceedingly hard to try to find a way to present a balanced, uh, independent, informed uh, digest of the evidence uh, that they have at their disposal and try to remove as much as humanly possible the uh, implicit uh, biases that they carry with them. But, you know, it is a fact of life that they were part of the, the part of the pandemic and that, that, you know, automatically has, you know, implications. But I think, they do spend an awful lot of time, and I certainly know that I spent a lot of time just trying to work out if in pieces of advice I was giving, there was anything that would be you know, implicit rather than explicit from the evidence that I was trying to synthesize. Is, is, there, uh, is there a tension? This is another question here, which uh, I think is a really interesting one from a politics and an expertise point of view, which is, is there a tension between 
the short term uh, realities of politics um, and the longer term nature of many of the the decisions that experts need to advise on. And of course, you know, we could nominate climate change as the most obvious of those examples, but there are many um, other cases. And is there any way in which we can resolve that tension? I guess I'll, I'll add that little rider on the end for one of you to um, fix for us. <laughs> so, um, uh, John, let's come back to you first and I'll come across to Anna. Thank you. I mean, so for me, again, it comes back to you shouldn't change the evidence you're presenting based on whether you think it is a short term or a long term decision. I think it is that you need to absolutely understand the context that the decision is being made in and you need to understand that as your advice is being given. But the evidence should be there. And if long term, uh, if there are long term implications for what is happening and short term, they should both be part of the advice that you are giving. Now, it is then for others to decide which one they are going to wait under that cycle. But you, as a someone who is giving advice, should not try to game the system by working out which what a particular decision is going to be made. I think that's the whole point of giving the advice is that you should have all the advice in there so that people can legitimately decide whether they want to take a longer or shorter term view. Anna, can I get your that's, view on it? That, that's a great way to put the idea. So let me just try and complicate it. So one um, uh, phenomenon that um, we teach uh, a lot in the history and philosophy of science is the phenomenon of inductive risk. Inductive risk is the idea where you adjust the level of uh, uh, confirmation and evidence that uh, that is needed depending on the seriousness of the situation. So if the consequences are very, very bad, then it is permissible to um, not wait for absolute certainty uh, to, uh, to, to, to make a claim, uh, yes, this is going to happen or yes, this is not going to happen. So um, that, that phenomenon generalizes to many cases you know if uh, a doctor uh, gives an advice to a patient and uh, um, the doctor uh, sees that the stakes are extremely high it is very hard to tell that doctor no you should not be framing your advice in such a way as to make it likely that the patient would um, uh, for example do 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 what is needed to preserve their their health so that sort of ideal where, you know, advice is only advice when uh, we use um, certain kind of uh, universal, not context specific and not driven by the expedience of the current situation level of confirmation. And we do not um, take on board the urgency is a great ideal, which is actually Sometimes hard to justify is all I'm going to say. I, I imagine we could continue that discussion point for um, for some time. Uh, let me uh, expertly weave through um, one of the other questions in response to this dilemma, which is uh, with the role of AI technologies uh, now um, ever increasing and the their capacities ever increasing. Um, uh, does that hold the potential of avoiding um, uh, nagging uh, doubts and problems of, of human uh, intellect being applied to problems? Uh, could AI provide the answer? John, perhaps if I ask you. I think we could probably have a discussion on this for the, for the next hour, but um, uh, I will just limit what I say to so that I think, particularly at the moment, a lot of what we have with AI um, depends on the training data that you put in. And at the moment, that training data is usually coming from data that has already got implicit uh, information in it. So I think uh, we, while I'm sure AI will make great strides in uh, the kind of things that we can understand and the, and the kind of information we can bring together, um, I think we are still uh, still at a time when uh, AI is quite um, related to uh, the the way the information is put together, usually by humans. To add to uh, the problem that John uh, brought out, which is the problem of uh, potentially biased data sets, we also want to consider the fact that um, 
in order for a decision to be legitimate in the public sphere, it needs to be explainable. And we need to be able to give a justification for it. Um, uh, people need to know why they got refused for a bank loan or why they uh, got put into a control group or a, a, a experimental group if they asked. Uh, that is because uh, this is their right to self-advocacy. Their right to self-advocacy requires an explanation. And one of the greatest challenges of uh, AI decision-making that many colleagues in Cambridge are working on is uh, ensuring that sort of transparency and explainability. And, uh, and until that, cha you know, challenges, uh, um, until they figure out how to do it, I would rather not um, outsource decisions to AI. Seems very sensible from a man who's currently got two computers running and is nervous about both. Um, what, an, what an excellent note to finish on, um, because I'm afraid we have uh, already uh, run out of time. Um, uh, thank you all very much out there for your really interesting questions. I know <laughs> there are an extraordinary number that are as yet unanswered, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, but thank you so much for your engagement with the discussion. Um, can I thank my uh, colleagues and fellow panellists and friends, Anna Alexandrova and John Aston, for um, giving of your expertise, if I can put it that way, for this discussion. I think it's been a terrific um, conversation. My thanks to everyone out there who uh, has held on and stuck with us for the conversation. Um, you have more to look forward to in Cambridge Conversations. I've got a note here that the next one, hosted by Professor Andy Parker, um, will take place on Wednesday 23rd of March uh, on the topic of whether there is life out there in the universe beyond the planet on which we are standing. So that sounds like an interesting uh, discussion to participate in. So we do hope that you can join us for that one. Uh, in the meantime, this conversation will shortly be posted uh, on our YouTube channel. So um, if you enjoyed it, please do uh, go and enjoy it uh, there again. And in the meantime, it just remains for me to say thank you for joining us and uh, goodbye. <laughs>